reminded of this, uh, this lecturer uh, in Hyde Park, London, that was speaking out against religion one day. And he said, my hatred of religion is inherited. My grandfather was an atheist, my father was an atheist, and thank God I'm an atheist too. <laughs> Unfortunately, that little rant, I think, is representative of a growing number of people in America and in the world around us. And, and you know, to some extent, so is the logic. Uh, according to a, a worldwide poll called the, the Global Index of Religiosity and Atheism, uh, the number uh, of people, the percentage of people in America who say they are religious dropped from 73% in 2005 to 60% in 2013, which is the last time I could find the numbers. At, at that same time, the number of Americans who say they are atheists rose from 1% to 5%. And then, of course, the remaining people are just, you know, maybe they believe in God, but they don't go to church, or, or maybe they're agnostic, that kind of thing. But the seven years in between 2005 and 2013 are significant because 2005 saw the publication of the book The End of Faith by Sam Harris, which was the first in a wave of, of best-selling books by on atheism by authors like Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett. And these four authors in particular are sometimes referred to as the, the four horsemen of the new atheism. Um, sadly, many of these new atheists, like this new generation of atheists that's coming about, either don't understand or have never really considered the, the inconsistencies of atheism. And that's why it's more important than ever, I think, for Christians like you and me to be able to uh, explain why our faith makes sense, to be able to good, give good reasons for people to believe in God. And as our anchor verse for this series makes clear, God expects nothing less of us. Uh, we've looked at this verse uh, the last couple of weeks. 1 Peter 3, verse 15 and 16 says, Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. However, do this with gentleness and respect. And so in keeping with this command uh, throughout this series, I want to give you five good reasons to believe in God. Five reasons that you can share with other people with gentleness and respect. And, and we can think of these as the five fingerprints of God. You know, evidence that God has left behind on the, the crime scene of the universe. Uh, and if you're, you're skeptical, or maybe you just struggle with doubts occasionally, because even, even devout Christians sometimes, you know, we have those gnawing doubts, like, what if I'm wrong? What if this God doesn't exist? And stuff like that. We get those questions from time to time. And, and so, if we look at these five different lines of evidence, it will lead us to either a stronger faith, or maybe help somebody begin to have faith in God. Uh, and these five lines of evidence are cosmology, creation, conscience, Christ, and conversion. Now, the, the, the last couple of weeks, last week and the week before, we focused primarily on scientific evidence for the existence of God, namely the evidence of cosmology and creation. And cosmology uh, reveals that the best explanation for the origin of the universe, the answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is God, or more specifically, that there is a, a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, unimaginably powerful cause to the universe. And then the evidence from creation reveals that there is an intelligent designer behind the universe. You know, we look specifically at uh, the uh, fine tuning of the universe, the, the various constants and quantities that are essential to allow life to exist anywhere at all throughout the cosmos. And, and the design inherent in the universe and, and even within you know, living organisms and, and microbiology and things like that all point us to an intelligent creator of the universe. But these things don't tell us a whole lot about who this creator is is or what he's like. And that brings us to the, the third fingerprint, if you will, which is the evidence of conscience. I like how Jiminy Cricket responded in the 1940 classic when Pinocchio asked, what's a conscience? Jiminy said, what's a conscience? I'll tell you. 
a conscience is that still small voice that people don't listen to. That's the trouble with the world today. And to paraphrase the Blue Fairies follow-up, your conscience is what allows you to differentiate between right and wrong, you know, good and evil, moral and immoral. And the Bible has something to say about that. We read in Romans chapter 2, verses uh, 14 and 15, even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know His law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they're doing right. Now, by letting our conscience be our guide, we discover another powerful argument for the existence of God, namely the moral argument. And once again, I want to play a short animated video for you from Reasonable Faith that will explain the moral argument and how it points us to the existence of God. Let's watch this together. Can you be good without God? Let's find out. Absolutely astounding. There you have it. Undeniable proof that you can be good without believing in God. But wait. The question isn't, can you be good without believing in God? The question is, can you be good without God? See, here's the problem. If there is no God, what basis remains for objective good or bad, right or wrong? If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. And here's why. Without some objective reference point, we have no way of saying that something is really up or down. God's nature provides an objective reference point for moral values. It's the standard against which all actions and decisions are measured. But if there's no God, there's no objective reference point. All we're left with is one person's viewpoint, which is no more valid than anyone else's viewpoint. This kind of morality is subjective, not objective. It's like a preference for strawberry ice cream. The preference is in the subject, not the object. So it doesn't apply to other people. In the same way, subjective morality applies only to the subject. It's not valid or binding for anyone else. So, in a world without God, there can be no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. God has expressed His moral nature to us as commands. These provide the basis for moral duties. For example, God's essential attribute of love is expressed in His command to love your neighbor as yourself. This command provides a foundation upon which we can affirm the objective goodness of generosity, self-sacrifice, and equality. And we can condemn as objectively evil greed, abuse, and discrimination. This raises a problem. Is something good just because God wills it, or does God will something because it is good? The answer is neither one. Rather, God wills something because He is good. God is the standard of moral values, just as a live musical performance is the standard for a high fidelity recording. Without your love. The more a recording sounds like the original, the better it is. Likewise, the more closely a moral action conforms to God's nature, the better it is. But if atheism is true, there is no ultimate standard. So there can be no moral obligations or duties. Who or what lays such duties upon us? No one. Remember, for the atheist, humans are just accidents of nature, highly evolved animals. But animals have no moral obligations to one another. When a cat kills a mouse, it hasn't done anything morally wrong. The cat's just being a cat. If God doesn't exist, we should view human behavior in the same way. No action should be considered morally right or wrong. But the problem is, good and bad, right and wrong, do exist. Just as our sense experience convinces us that the physical world is objectively real, oh. our moral experience convinces us that moral values are objectively real. Every time you say, 
Hey, that's not fair. That's wrong. That's an injustice. You affirm your belief in the existence of objective morals. We're well aware that child abuse, racial discrimination, and terrorism are wrong for everybody, always. Is this just a personal preference or opinion? No. The man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. What all this amounts to then is a moral argument for the existence of God. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. But objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. Atheism fails to provide a foundation for the moral reality every one of us experiences every day. In fact, the existence of objective morality points us directly to the existence of God. I'm reminded of a, a little boy who had been attending Sunday school for you know all of his life, and and he always had the same Sunday school teacher for a long time. And she would always end Sunday school class with the moral of the story is, and then she would, you know, explain what the, the moral is. And, uh, and then eventually, you know, he got a little bit older and he moved into a new Sunday school class with a new teacher. And his mom asked him how he liked the class. And he says, well, she's okay, I guess, but she ain't got no morals at all. <laughs> when it comes to the uh, moral argument for God's existence, that's not exactly the kind of morals we're talking about. Rather, by morals, we mean a person's standard of behavior concerning right and wrong, good and evil, stuff like that. And, and by objective moral values, we mean moral values that are valid and binding, independent of human opinion. For example, to say that the Holocaust was objectively evil means that it was evil, it was wrong, even though the Nazis who perpetrated, be, perpetrated it believed that it was right. And it would still be wrong, even if the Nazis had won World War II and succeeded in exterminating or brainwashing anyone who disagreed with them. As William Penn put it, right is right, even if everyone is against it, and wrong is wrong, even if everyone is for it. If William Penn is correct, the only way that he could be correct is if God exists. So let's explore the, the premises premises of the, uh, the moral argument this morning and discover how your conscience provides powerful evidence for God's existence. First, if God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. Put another way, if, if there is no God, then there really is no such thing as good and evil right or wrong. You know, what we call right and wrong, it, it, there's no real difference, objectively speaking. The values that we hold dear, such as do not lie, do not steal, or love your neighbor as yourself, these are just social conventions, like driving on the right side of the road instead of on the left side of the road. Or they're, they're just matters of opinion, like preferring pizza over tacos, that kind of thing. Now, traditionally, human morality has been grounded in the nature of God. But in an atheistic worldview, human beings are just highly evolved primates, the, the byproduct of natural selection acting on random mutation. And our morals are simply a, a sort of herd mentality that evolved from sociobiological conditioning as a means of continuing or propagating our species. In other words, humans simply invented the concept of right and wrong in order to help our species survive. If that's true, then certain actions such as rape or murder might not be biologically or socially advantageous and so have been, become socially unacceptable. But that does nothing to say that rape or murder is actually wrong in any way. Such behavior goes on all the time in the animal kingdom. You know, when a, a hawk snatches, snatches a fish out of the river, it kills the fish. It doesn't murder the fish. You know, the hawk hasn't done anything wrong. It's, it's not in trouble of going to jail because it killed this fish out of the river. And if a, a bigger hawk comes along and steals the fish out of the, the other hawk's mouth, 
Well, it takes the fish. It hasn't really stolen anything. Again, the hawk hasn't done anything wrong. It's just being a hawk. Morality is completely foreign to the animal world. I'm reminded of this uh, Dear Abby letter written many years ago. A man writes, Dear Abby, I'm a man in love and I'm having an affair with two different women other than my wife. I love my wife, but I love these other women too. Please tell me what to do, but don't give me any of that morality stuff. Signed, too much love for only one. In this case, Abby's answer was classic. She replied, dear, too much love for only one. The only difference between humans and animals is morality. Please write to a veterinarian. I think she was absolutely right. But, but if we are just highly evolved apes, then why do we have morality and they don't? Why are some things right and wrong for us, but there, that concept doesn't exist in the animal kingdom? Michael Roos, uh, a noted philosopher of science, writes, the position of the modern evolutionist is that morality is a biological adaptation no less than our hands or feet or teeth. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. Charles Darwin even went so far as to, to say in his book, The Descent of Man, he, he posited a different scenario in which our morality could be dramatically different from what it is if we had evolved differently. And so he says, if men were reared under precisely the same conditions as hive bees, there could hardly be any doubt that our unmarried females would, like worker bees, think it a sacred duty to kill their brothers, and mothers would strive to kill their fer fertile daughters, and no one would think anything of it. In his book, The, uh, the Blind Watchmaker, atheist Rich Richard Dawkins says, There is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. We are machines for propagating DNA, it is every living thing's sole purpose for being. Dawkins' assessment may seem depressing, but if there is no God, then he's absolutely right. And if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. There is no actual difference between right and wrong. These are just invented concepts. But that brings us to the second premise, which is objective moral values and duties do exist. And we all know it. Yeah, we know that rape and murder and child abuse are really wrong. These actions aren't just you know, mere breaches of some imaginary social contract that we've made. They're moral abominations. Now, I don't have to convince you, and I hopefully don't have to convince anybody else, that some things are truly good and other things are truly evil. We all know it. Even, even the most ardent atheists agree that some things are really wrong. Take Richard Dawkins, for instance. With one hand, he writes that there's no good and no evil, but then with the other hand, he writes that the uh, abuse and harassment of homosexuals, the Incan practice of human sacrifice, among many other things, are morally wrong. He's even gone so far as to write his own version of the Ten Commandments for atheists. Um, Michael Roos, the other philosopher that I quoted a moment ago, he was actually quoted in the video as well saying that the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man that says two plus two equals five. That is an incredibly powerful statement coming from an atheist. Because what he's saying, two plus two equals five, is a factual error, right? It doesn't matter how you feel about it, it's just wrong. And 2 plus 2 equals 4 is factually true, regardless of how we feel about it. And what he's saying is that the same principle applies to our morality. That rape and murder and other things like that are wrong regardless of how you feel about them. And similarly, things like love and compassion and kindness and equality and self-sacrifice are really good. And so it's clear, even to, to non-religious people, and unbelievers that some things at least are good and evil. And again, as Scripture puts it in Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, even though they do not have the law, they show that in their hearts they know what is right and wrong, just as the law commands. 
And they show this by their consciences. Sometimes their thoughts tell them they did wrong, and sometimes their thoughts tell them they did right. Our own consciences, our personal moral experiences, confirm that some things are objectively good or evil, right or wrong. And therefore we have good grounds for believing that the second premise is true. Objective moral values really do exist. So if we're convinced that some behaviors are truly wrong or truly right, then the conclusion must be true as well. Therefore, God exists. From the two premises, it follows logically that God must exist. And this argument is very important, I think, as a complement to the cosmological argument and the, you know, the argument from creation. Because the evidence of, of creation and the evidence of cosmology point us to this, this timeless, spaceless, you know, unimaginably powerful, intelligent creator, but they don't tell us a whole lot about that creator. Like, it, it doesn't get you directly to the Christian God. It's a lot like, has a lot of properties in common with the Christian God, but it doesn't tell you a whole lot about who this creator is. The moral argument, on the other hand, tells us a significant, important truth about this creator, namely, that God is is good. Our moral values like honesty, integrity, compassion, self-sacrifice, kindness, goodness, etc. are all grounded in the nature of God. God himself is the source of of moral rightness and his commands like treat others the way you want to be treated or care for orphans and widows and help the weak and don't lie or cheat or steal, etc. These are all reflections of his nature. God is good And therefore, we are commanded and instructed. We have the obligation to be good as well. Like the psalmist, we can say in in Psalm 119, verse 73, you made me, you created me. Now give me the sense to follow your commands. I think this is one of the most compelling arguments for the existence of God because it appeals to a person's conscience. Uh, their innate sense of right and wrong. We all instinctively see things that we feel like are wrong, that, that we think are good, and, and it touches us where we live. Every day you, you wake up and answer the question of whether or not you believe there are objective moral values by how you live. And so I want to encourage you not only to, to share this argument with your friends or family members or whatever who may be skeptical about God's existence, but also live your life in a way that's consistent with your own conscience and God's commands. And I also want to, of course, invite you to come back again next week as we explore the evidence for God's existence from Christ, specifically evidence for God's existence based on the resurrection of Christ. In the meantime, let me remind you that the God who created you and who gave you a conscience also wants you to know him personally. Uh, The Bible says in James 4, verse 8, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. And so I want to encourage you to do that right now as we stand and sing together. Let's sing, church.